reading Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, or out of it flow the wellspring of life. I want to talk this morning about the human heart and the importance of it. And I'm not talking about plainly the physical heart, although the physical heart is a very good illustration of the human heart, namely the heart of our being, the seat of our being, because just as life flows from the, heat, from the physical human heart, so all that we do comes from our hearts, the centre of our being. Well, that word heart comes from the Hebrew word lab, spelt L-E-B. It's used figuratively, very widely, for the feelings, the will and the intellect, the centre of anything. If you want to look at what a man is, you see the things that he does, and that speaks of what he is inside. None of us can see the human heart in that sense. We could see a heart through an x-ray, but the center of one's being, what motivates the individual, that is denied to us. But all we have is we see the results of that person's Act, sorry, that person's thoughts and his motivations in the things that he does. Well, we live in a society where people feel it's their right to give expression to their hearts. In other words, to do what they want. And as a result, many just let their passions run riot. And so we have these rights movements so that when we compare, for example, the right of an unborn child with the right of his mother to choose, his or her mother to choose, always the right of the mother seems to have take the preeminence because that the underlying rationale is that that woman has the right to choose her destiny, even if it means destroying the life of the baby that she's carrying in the womb. That baby, under the law of most countries, not all, but most, has no rights of its own. And as I said, that's because governments have decided that they will let people, pregnant women, do as they please. Their responsibility, their God-given responsibility to the baby that they carry in their womb is ignored and indeed, in many cases, despised. Well, the danger is that not just pregnant women can do what they like, but we see in all all parts of life, particularly at the end of life, that lives are brought increasingly to a premature end because life is measured in its usefulness to citizens, usefulness to family members, the sanctity of life that the Bible speaks of, again, is ignored increasingly. The problem is that people don't realize that the human spirit, if allowed to run riot, will know no bounds. Proverbs 25, verse 28, speaks about a person who has no control over his spirit or over his heart. He that hath no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Anything can come in, anything can come out. And the Bible is very plain about the condition of our heart. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 puts it very succinctly and bluntly. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's quite frightening, isn't it? We probably all think we know, it, we know ourselves. But the Bible says none of us know the wickedness of our own hearts. We're born with wicked hearts. And without restraint, there's no depths to what wickedness the human heart could descend to. In Revelation 9, verse 2, we read of the angel opening the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. It's not entirely clear what that pit is, whether that pit is hell. It probably is. But it also gives a quite graphic illustration of the depths of wickedness in the human heart. Because the human heart is like a pit without a bottom. It's, there is no end to the pollution that it can cause in the world around it. And that's well illustrated by the Lord Jesus, who, compare, who was asked to really to compare, or indeed he was asked to comment on, um, whether people could eat clean or unclean foods, or whether they had to wash, ceremonially wash their hands. He does this in Mark chapter 7. And in verse 17, he states this, Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without, that's outside a man, entereth into the man, it cannot defile him. So whatever you eat can't defile you. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, that's unbridled sinful passions, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and defile the man. A person's not defiled by anything he eats. You should be clear about that. But he is defiled by the things that come out of his heart. I wonder if that's your understanding of the human heart, or whether you think that's a little bit too shocking, a little bit too graphic. But may I ask you this? Supposing somebody was to play a video of all your thoughts in the last 24 hours, and they were to put them on the screen and we would all sit back and watch, what would you be thinking just as those, your turn came for your thoughts to be played out across the screen in front of all of us? Might you be worse than red with embarrassment? Would I be? The answer is, we would all be, I suggest. Because there are things that we think that we would never want anybody else to know about. And we probably conveniently forget very quickly that we've had those thoughts. Well, if this is the state of the human heart, there's no wonder that the world is in the state that it is. There is, though, some controls that God has graciously ordained since the beginning of time that should try, that he's put in place to try and control the wickedness of humanity. In Genesis 2, God ordained marriage between a man and a woman so that a child has a loving, stable, loving environment to be brought up with. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to think that God has chosen your mother and father. And so often a 
child will look like his mother or father, his or her mother or father. And there is a natural bond that springs up of affection. It's a terrible thing when that doesn't happen. Occasionally it doesn't. Thankfully, very occasionally. But normally, we all love our mothers and fathers. And they love us. And it's a wonderful thing to feel valued when you come into this world. That's a gift God has given all humanity. It's common grace. Even thieves and robbers, murderers, will have affection, generally speaking, for their children. I look, I'm not saying in every case, but that is what God has given generally as part of his common grace to humanity. He's also given parents authority, recognizing that there are times when only using physical force, appropriate physical force, is necessary to restrain evil. We read it in a number of places in the Proverbs. I've found three places. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Proverbs 23, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. And Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Leave a child without correction, and he will bring shame on his mother and his father. That is the teaching of Scripture. And that is not to suggest that the rod on its own can achieve a healthy, well-balanced, well-rounded adult at the end of his life. You only use physical force when, you ha when, when you're allowed to. And in this country, you can really only use your hand. Because if you use any implement and you leave any mark, then you've broken the law. And I, it's not the purpose of my sermon um, to encourage you to break the law, but it is, and I certainly don't advise that, but it is my purpose to show the human heart and its wickedness and the need to correct it, correct it in children, the means that God has ordained in the Bible. I think it's very sad that um, our institutions, our government, does not see the wisdom of correction. Generally, that is because it doesn't trust parents anymore to bring correction in a measured way. Well, that is very sad, and yet Scripture itself does have that warning to parents. In Ephesians 6, verse 4, we read, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't provoke them to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you keep beating a child for no reason, you will end up having a very angry child because he will feel that he has been unjustly treated. We should, if we are going to administer any kind of punishment on our children, it should be done fairly and in an appropriate measure to the seriousness of what that child has done. If you just think that you can hit them every time that there's a misdemeanor, you won't find that you've got loving, obedient children at the end of it. Well, today we face an assault on this stabilizing institution of marriage and family life. Increasingly, the state is taking the place of the family and bringing up children. And it's weakening the power, as I've said, of children and uh, of parents and, and schools to bring correction to children. And in a time when family life is breaking down and so often the mother is out working, doesn't give appropriate time to the children. They run riots. And we saw it a few years ago in London, didn't we? Those riots, I think it was 2010 in August. Terrible riots. And what was the cause of them? Well, to some extent, it was rather extraordinary because they were even middle class people with quite wealthy parents rioting. But we cannot ignore the state of family life. That if you don't bring up children responsibly, to, to take their responsibilities in society seriously, they will think they can run riot and no one will do anything about it. They won't respect 
authority if they are not brought up with authority in their lives. And you get lawlessness. I don't know if any of you have read or I think there was a film of The Lord of the Flies by William Golding. It's a book that certainly I studied at school and I expect some of you did too. But it's where a group of boys find themselves on a desert island. Their plane was shot down and they crash landed on this island. And they were left to fend for themselves. And the book documents the steady descent to animal-like behavior, where in the absence of parental authority, they end up hunting and even killing each other. It's a frightening expose of the wickedness of the human heart, left unrestrained in children. Well, God has, thirdly, God has given us government to impose authority on us. We see this in Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2. In Romans 13, that we'll be looking at soon, we read, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Rulers are appointed by God. Government, that institution, is appointed by God for the good of humankind because God knows that only by having a government there which has authority to punish, even to the taking of life, will people respect its dictates and live as responsible citizens um, on earth. In 1 Peter 2 we read in verse 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Friends, it's talking to Christians, and of course we should make sure we obey the law, whatever it is. Someone was mentioning on the course I went on last week about, um, as a cyclist, stopping at red lights. And that's a challenge to me. It's a challenge I try and rise to. And try and stop at red lights, try and obey the law of the land. Each of us should, even if we don't see the need of a law, provided it's not contrary to God's law, we should obey it. And we should obey it as if God had given it to us himself. Well, these restraints are sufficient for most of us. But then you think of monsters like Genghis Khan, Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, to name but a few of the wicked rulers that have caused terrible evil in this world and destroyed many innocent lives. You think of Adolf Hitler, how he used the very instruments of government that God appointed for good. He used them to try and wipe out the Jewish race. And he, in a space of five years or so, he managed to wipe out about four million Jews in his attempt to destroy them from the face of the earth. Well, friends, Lest we think that these were just isolated individuals who bear no resemblance to the rest of us, consider first how many people supported those regimes. How many people read about them today? The rise of the neo-Nazis in places in Europe and even in our own land. Friends, very often, these are people who give vent to their heart's desires because they don't care about the restraints that are put upon them. And they're willing to push the boundaries in a way that other people no less wicked but are not willing to push the boundaries because they fear the consequences. Friends, the heart, the human heart is a terrible thing. And none of us can boast 
that our hearts are any less wicked when we think of what comes out of the human heart, when we think of what's come out of our hearts, even in the last 24 hours, I hope we are all persuaded in its wickedness. And the need for us to have new hearts that only God can give us. We read this in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Well, the Lord Jesus has provided that new heart for everyone who will come to him in recognition of the wickedness of their own hearts. That's what happens when we're born again. The Lord Jesus tells us, doesn't he, that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Friends, we all need a spiritual birth to reconnect us with God. And friends, we believe through the heart. When we trust in Christ, it is with the heart, that same heart, but a heart transformed by God's Spirit. We read this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This act of believing is not possible without a sovereign act of God's grace in our lives. And as I have said, this he does by sending his Holy Spirit, convincing men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's only when our hearts come under the influence of God's word that we develop as Christians. Think of the parable of the sower. That it was on the good ground in Luke 8 verse 15, which is an honest and good heart, that having heard the word and keeping it, fruit is brought forth. If you want to have a fruitful life, your heart must receive the word of God and do it. Do we have hearts that are open to receive the word of God and do it in its entirety? Or do we block out bits as it suits us? There is a battle for each of us in our hearts. We come under attack. The devil tries to snatch the word from us before it takes root in our hearts. And I wonder if that has happened to you. You hear a sermon, you realize what you should do, but then suddenly something else comes up and you forget all about what you learned. Luke 8 verse 12 warns us, Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The seed that falls by the wayside in that parable is like somebody who hears, but then the devil comes and steals away the word. Then there are those who find the Christian life difficult. The parable of the sir speaks of the word falling on rocky ground. It springs up. The Christian's full of joy, but then it gets tough, and he gives up. Then there's a Christian who gets so caught up with everything going on in the world that he becomes unfruitful in his Christian life. We read that in Luke 8, verse 14. And that which fell among thorns, that they, which when they've heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. I wonder if we fall into one of those categories. I hope we all fall into the categories that our hearts are open to the word of God, to receive it and to do it we can be said to have good and honest hearts. 
Our hearts, friends, are like gardens that need tending. We need to rip out the weeds that grow up so quickly, get sown by the world around us, by the devil that's so ever active. Our faith must be allowed to to develop, which means allowing our hearts to be fed on a diet of God's word. So often, some temptation will come in along the lines, well, surely God would allow me to have this as well. And when you have this, you suddenly find that you're being pulled off in another direction. Friends, we need to let God's word work in our hearts. And then, what we are will be plain by what we do. And Paul was able to write about the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us. He wrote the, his letters. So if you wanted to see the fruit of Paul's ministry, what it was like, you looked at Christians that he'd been ministering to, and you see they're lively, that they are living out the Christian life obediently and fully and joyfully. And you can say, well, that is Paul's commendation. Be wonderful, isn't it, that that could be our commendation here. Christians who've received the word and are doing it. And they'll commend the work of strangers' rest. If all of us do that, we shouldn't be looking to other people to say what a good church it is, but they should be looking at us and seeing, yes, Christ is in us. We're being obedient followers, and it's changed their lives. Our lives and our hearts reflect what is written on our hearts, which is the Word of God. So we must fill our hearts with God's Word if we're to keep our hearts. In 1 Peter 2, verse 2, we read, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. If you want to grow the Christian, you've got to read God's Word. I hope we are all doing that. And we must let the Word of God burn in our hearts on the road to Emmaus. Remember, those two disciples were joined by the Lord Jesus. They didn't realize he was there. and They asked him. They didn't realize who he was, and they asked him um, to tell them what had been going on. And he reasoned with them in the Scriptures why Christ must suffer and die and rise again. And they said to each other afterwards, did not our hearts burn within us while he taught with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Have you known that experience of the word of God burning in your heart? This isn't just a book, friends. It's not just a duty we do. It's a living book. It's the living word of God. It's wonderful when it takes a hold of us. We heard from our sister Faith that when the word took hold of her when she was waiting on the Lord for direction. Friends, it should be like that for all of us. The word of God takes hold of us in our hearts and directs us. Well, friends, there's a real need for us to guard our hearts with all diligence, isn't it? To be very careful about our hearts, recognizing that it will tell us, it will dictate the course our life takes. You see, the Lord warns us that m- the love of money is the root of all evil. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, if we love money, we can't serve God as well. The Lord Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 6 that we cannot serve God and mammon. You've got to choose who you're going to serve. That doesn't mean to say that you'll never have any money as a Christian, but what it does mean is that you'll put God first. And that his, and any money you have, you will consider to be his money and not your own. And there's a danger when our hearts are captured by the love of another person. It can be 
the innocence, as it were, natural love of our parents, of our family. Even them we have to put second to Christ, don't we? We're not to be taken off course by our parents. That is not to say we're, that we don't have a duty to honour them. We do have a duty to honour them. But we honour them under God. We mustn't let our families or our friends take us off the course that God has set for us. They must be subject to Christ being first, being our, being our chief, the chief of our heart, as we were looking at last week. The um, Old Testament kings were warned about multiplying wives to themselves. Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, we read, Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he, he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. But this is exactly what King Solomon did. We read in 1 Kings 11, verse 3, And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart from other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. How sad that was, that a woman should turn away his heart. Marriage is a wonderful thing, it's an honourable thing. Marriage is honourable in all the marriage bed undefiled, we're told in Hebrews chapter 13. It's a good thing to marry, but it's not a good thing if you marry someone who's going to take your heart away from your first love to God. And we all should know that, friends, that if we are, any of us are in a relationship or tempted to be in a relationship which is subtly taking us away from the work that we know that we're being called to, then we have to reconcile that and not allow ourselves to be deceived. It'll come to all of us. The devil will try anything, friends, and this is a particularly vulnerable spot for all of us because inevitably we are made for company. And most Christians will marry, and it's right that they marry. But friends, we must be sure that if we're going to marry, we don't fall into the trap that Solomon fell into, where he allowed his eyes to govern who he married. Perhaps he allowed other factors to come in, but hadn't really sought the Lord for his choice. Friends, we must do that to make sure our hearts are guarded and not taken off course. Then there's the corrupting influence of the media all around us. We're told by Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Friends, do we do that? Do we resolutely turn our face away from those things that would corrupt us? We must be diligent to do that. All of us, including myself. It is ironic to me that in 1934, the BBC's motto was changed to quae cumque, which means whatsoever. And whatsoever came from Philippians 4 verse 8. If only all that we saw on the BBC was true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. Wouldn't that transform our nation? But how tragic that the opposite is the case, that you're more likely to be corrupted by the BBC 
been edified by it. Friends, going back to our text verse, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Friends, everything flows from our hearts, from the center of our being. We've got to keep it as Christians. We've been given new hearts. Let's cherish it. Let's feed it like a gardener tending his most precious flower beds. I heard of a, a prank where they, um, one school, um, they, one night they dug up the prized daffodils of a housemaster and replanted them in another housemaster's garden. Friends, who knows what the reaction was. No doubt someone thought it was funny. But we don't want someone uprooting the prized possessions in our hearts and taking them away somewhere else, do we? We need to guard and be diligent about our own hearts, friends. And in Proverbs 4, in the first few verses, you get some very good advice. Just reading from verse 1 as I come to an end. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son. This is Solomon writing. David was his father. Tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. That was Bathsheba. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. This was David. How much more, friends, should we listen to, that, to great David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and keep his commandments and live forever? In verse 5 we read, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. It's all in this book, friends. We must keep its instruction at the foremost, foremost part of our hearts. And then, friends, we will find that we will live fruitful Christian lives, lives of peace and joy and fulfillment. And everything that we need will be given to us in its place and in its time. So let us guard our hearts with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Amen.